Well, hello everyone. This is Matthew Barnett and we're here for our first episode ever on the podcast, the We Get To podcast, where everything is a get to. We get to deal with problems. We get to deal with great stories of victory and joy. And this is such an unbelievable day to start our first podcast, the We Get To podcast. And I'm so excited to have with us our first guest is the leader of Dream City Church in Phoenix, Arizona, pastor, author, extraordinaire, my brother, Luke Barnett. And I don't think there's anybody, folks, who understands a little bit more about what it's like being raised in ministry and what it's like being raised in a, in a very uh, high-profile ministry and all that goes along with it. But Luke, we are so glad to have you. Tell us, what is going on right now in the life of yourself, the church, or uh, culture abroad, or pastoring in the middle of the, of the, of the day and age where we're living in? And uh, what are the victories and challenges in your life? Well, uh, it's great to be here and uh, sure love the uh, all the great work that is happening here at the Los Angeles Dream Center and Angeles Temple. You guys truly are setting the pace for what's taking place in ministry all around the world and just walking around here this morning and seeing all the disciples out there pumping iron and <laughs> I walked over and high five them all. They're sweating, their hearts are pumping and uh, so it was just really cool to see all the ministry going on here every single day. You guys truly are the church that never sleeps. It's just 24 7 but with regard to what's taking place in our world, you know, Angel and I are now empty nesters. So, uh, you know, both of our kids are uh, out of the house, uh, married uh, pastors. They're both involved in the ministry uh, there in Phoenix. So it's, uh, it's a great season for us. Angel, you know, she was the, the kind of mom that focused on raising our kids while they were in their formative years. And now, uh, you know, she's taken off with uh, the ministry that God has called her to do as well. So a lot of great things are happening with uh, uh, the Barnett family in, in Phoenix. And uh, of course, ministry-wise, in the last uh, 10 years, we've gone from one campus to 13 campuses. 13. And so it's just been a whirlwind of, of great things happening, new challenges, having to reallocate resources to make sure that we're strong in all of our campuses. But uh, it keeps us busy. It keeps our mind in the game, and it's just, it's been a great season. Yeah, I think you're one of the only churches I know that didn't just survive COVID, but you actually surged during COVID, which is pretty incredible. I think say, those that survived considered to do very, very well, yeah. and those who even maintained or even went back a little bit uh, did well. But you guys during that season just seemed to just flourish, and um, I, I think a lot of that is due to the fact of how you we were raised. Um, a lot of people are always asking the question, you know, what's the secret of Tommy Barnett and the secret of his leadership and, and the kind of person that he was at home? And uh, what do you think the one great value um, that, and I think I'll have probably a different one too, that you kind of experienced being raised in such a legacy father who's built so many churches and impacted the world. And is there one thing that you kind of learned or gained from him that you feel like is, has driven most of your pursuit in going forward and just surviving things and, you know, getting through those tough times of ministry sometimes. Yeah, I think probably the, the, the most important thing is uh, that spirit of persistence, you know, not quitting, <laughs> hanging in there because ministry is hard. And, uh, you know, there's, there's ups and downs and there's great spiritual highs and spiritual lows as well. And uh, it's just learning to um, navigate, you know, all those ups and downs, the, the mountaintops and also the valleys. And so I think that that's the one thing is just don't quit. Uh, so many times when uh, I'll talk to dad and I'll say, dad, I just feel like, I feel like I can't do this anymore. I feel like quitting. He'd say, it's okay to feel like quitting if you know you're not going to quit. Mm. You can be a, a wanna quitter if you're not a quitter. And Good. what he will say to me generally when I get in that phase, and it's not very often, but uh, uh, when I feel like quitting, he'll say, you just need to go home and sleep. Huh. Just very practical. Go you, home and sleep. You are just worn out right now. You're not seeing clearly. And you know what? He's right. It's just a matter of, uh, you know, getting an afternoon to rest, eating some good food, and, um, you know, and you're ready to, to keep going. So I, I know it's, for some people it's, it's deeper than that because the challenges don't leave. But, you know, for me, um, if you just hang in there, and uh, as Dad always says, you got to outlive your critics. Whoa. You know, and just uh, stay, in, stay in the fight and uh, the tide will change. 
they say in sports, you have to have a short memory regarding losses yeah. um, and move on forward. And that, I think that's a really powerful principle because ministry, it's like you have a Sunday and if you fail or feel like you fail, sometimes that's not always true because you feel like you did bad and you're still ministering to people at the same time. But you really do have to have a short memory. You have to get right back up quickly because seven days will be another Sunday morning service. There'll be another. That's right. So there's no end to it. There's, there's no like off season. Mm -hmm. It's just all the time. And yeah. so how do you deal with the times where you feel like, man, I got it right today? Or times you feel like maybe you couldn't get across the message that you wanted to in the way. It, it, does that get easier to rebound from the longer you be in ministry or does it still get you? No, I think it does. I think that the longer you stay in the ministry, it does get easier. The ministry doesn't get easier, but uh, you're, you've been pushing that weight for so long that, that the weight doesn't feel as heavy. And, uh, you know, for, for me, uh, the highest emotional moment of my week is 5 a.m. on Sunday morning. I mean, I am I am jazzed up. I cannot <laughs> wait to get in that pulpit. It feels forever to get to 9 o'clock, or doesn't it? <laughs> I know. I've been preparing for like 15 hours. I got a word. I can't wait to unleash on the people. So that's my spiritual high of the week. Huh. My spiritual low happens the very same day. It's about 1 o'clock driving home huh. from service because I am completely emotionally, spiritually depleted. I've preached several times. I've shaken lots of hands. I've hugged lots of necks. And I'm kind of an intro introvert by nature. Mm -hmm. So it, when I get in my car, I am done with people. I don't, they, they can all go, <laughs> as Dad says, to the booger man. You know, I don't even care because I, I have nothing left. And while I'm driving home, I can just feel it oozing out of me. Mm -hmm. So all I want to do is stop by Kentucky Fried Chicken, get a bucket of chicken, <laughs> go sit in my Lazy Boy chair and watch the Diamondbacks lose to the Dodgers because it happens all the time. <laughs> and uh, I, I just, uh, and, and that's when I'm most vulnerable to uh, the enemy because I'm, I'm depleted, I'm hungry, I'm tired. And uh, of course, that's when Satan attacked Jesus. He'd fasted 40 days and 40 nights and he was worn out, he was tired and he was hungry. And the devil tried to get to him. Obviously, he couldn't. But, you know, if, if he tried to get to Jesus that way, you know, of course, he's going to try to get to us and we're tired. And, you know, Sunday afternoons, that's when I'm most vulnerable to his attacks. Yeah. To the lies. Like, man, I don't know if I can keep doing this. And you're just tired and hungry. You need some good food. You need to rest. And also to, to just uh, uh, be aware that that's when you are vulnerable. So you'll know how to counteract it. You're exactly right. Years ago, Deion Sanders came on a tour of the Dream Center. And we were walking him around this place. And it was an unbelievable experience. And I asked him what it was like to win a Super Bowl. And he said, you know, after he won the Super Bowl, that was the time that he almost took his own life and ran his, his car off a cliff. And I thought to myself, this is unbelievable. This is exactly what you lived your whole life for. And then when you got the thing that you wanted, you really... We're the most vulnerable. So that, I think that is so true that at the end of a great season, there's the enemy that just comes in or self-doubt or looking for other outlets, just all the things that, that, that we deal with, you know, we're after a great high or great victory. But, you know, I think, um, you know, being raised in the ministry and being raised around someone, you know, like Tommy Barnett, a lot of people think that, you know, it's always been with him. Like, he's such an upbeat guy, victory, victory, victory. And he is. That's generally the place that he's in, but he's gone through some dark moments himself where he's almost needed his children to come into his room to deliver his meals because, you know, the stress of ministry you know, got to him during some times where crazy articles, the Wall Street Journal, just making fun of him, nothing serious, but it still, it hurt. It was hurtful for him. And just, you know, we almost had to kind of come and minister to him. And I, and I think that's so important for people to realize that even the greats go through seasons of their life where they just don't know if they can get up and get going again. And I think that's what really kind of drove me into ministry is not necessarily seeing his highs all the time and his great victories was to see the fact that he was normal. He did crash. He did have those Bible experiences where David said, my bones are wasting away. I don't feel I can go on any longer. But he just slowly wiggled his way back up again and just got back into the fight. And so I think a lot of people misunderstand someone who's so positive, dynamic, as not having those moments. But I think in all of our lives of ministry, we face these crashing moments. I know mine was after my stroke. You know, I dealt with that stroke experience. That was horrible because 
that was a time where I just felt like, do I have enough left? Is it over? Flirting with the idea of just quitting and just getting up and preaching and having a foggy brain, which dad always says, that's relatively speaking, because you always been a little bit foggy. So I don't know if that's true or not. But, you know, going through that and self-doubt and having like maybe 20 minutes of em- uh, it was almost like a, as a gas tank after preaching a stroke, you like you can st- so suddenly feel you feel good. And then like your brain almost tells you, you got about five minutes left to wrap up this sermon because you can feel the energy being depleted from you. And so, you know, when, when you go through those times and um, and you just kind of lay there for a while, you, you just feel like, you know, such a failure. But the truth is, you know, those are times that God is just using to rebuild you back up again. And I know a lot of people face those crisis moments. I don't know if it's hit you that hard in ministry, but I think it's something we all deal with. Yeah, and the greatest people of God have dealt with it. James says that Elijah was a man like as we are. You know, Elijah, and he, in, in uh, 1 Kings 18, he, he has this amazing spiritual run where he's outrunning <laughs> steeds and he's c- calling down water from the heavens to end a drought and you know, just amazing miracles. And then in chapter 19, he goes right into talk, talking about how he wants to die. He says, Lord, just take my life. I'm no better than my father's. And uh, he was a person just like we are. And so, you know, if it can happen to someone like Elijah, who went on this amazing spiritual run, I mean, he was in the zone. And in 24 hours, 24 hours, his whole world changes because of Jezebel's threat. And he allowed the Jezebel's threat to get into his mind. When it got into his mind, it, it then controlled his emotions. You know, our, our, I heard it said our mind is like the, the engine of a train, and our emotions are like the caboose of a train. Mm-hmm. So wherever the engine goes, it goes up the hill, guess what? Your emotions go with it. If the engine of your mind goes down a hill, your emotions go with it. Our emotions always follow the thoughts in our mind. And uh, Elijah had this amazing spiritual mountain, but then 20, in just the next scene, uh, Jezebel has gotten into his mind, and now he wants to take his own life. So he's gone from you know discouragement to depression to despair all in 24 hours, where he wants to die. He literally Incredible. wants to die. So uh, ministry can make you feel that way sometimes. So I always tell our people, our church, don't let anyone ever tell you that uh, because you are depressed that you're not spiritual or that you don't love the Lord. Wow. Because some of the greatest men, you wow. know, Job got discouraged and he said, you know, why is this happening to me, God? Uh, David was always <laughs> discouraged, you know, <laughs> Lord, Lord help me, you know. And e- so e- emo type, yes. Yeah. I try to remember that when I'm going through uh, the valleys because because that, that's life. life. Life is mountaintops. It's also valleys. Yeah, no, it's, it's so powerful. And, uh, you know, in Los Angeles here, there's a lot of talk about like uh, mental health. And I know you have a, a really great kind of uh, understanding. You dove into that concept of mental health. But there's a lot of people that come into our program, our rehab program, and the world would basically say they're done. They're gone. They're mentally, you know, overwhelmed to the point they can't make it. And then they come into the program and they get 30, 60, 90, 120 good, good days under their belt. Yeah. And you realize that they just needed momentum of victory. Yeah. They just needed a train of successes, you know, to start building their confidence back again. And yes, there are issues of mental health, and yes, there are issues of that need to be dealt with on that level, but we're finding there's just so many people who have been down for so long that if they could just get the Word of God in them, if they could just get people to believe in them, if they get around some positive peer pressure, a lot of people are being, like, you know, misdiagnosed in that, and yet there's a lot of people who actually deal with it, and there's something they have to live with, you know, and, and, they're, and they're constantly battling it. So, um, so we're seeing a lot of people being transformed in the area of mental health just by being in the right place, the right atmosphere, and being kind of pulled along in that draft effect uh, of, of a lot of thing, good things that are happening. But what, is your, what do you think about that, that really, that word mental health and, and your perception of what's going on and, and what's God saying to you on that? It's pretty amazing. I read an article not too long ago about the uh, the mental health challenge and struggles uh, on a continuum that they've gone right up with the legalization of marijuana. Yeah. So drugs do have a major effect on that. I love what you said a moment ago that when they come to the Dream Center, they kind of they wean themselves off those drugs and they get some spiritual wins under their belt and uh, they start to see hope once again. 
and they start to see the, the light at the end of the tunnel. The mental health issue is a real issue, but there are reasons for it, mm -hmm. you know, and, and a lot of the reasons I think are, you know, the, the digital, yes. the, the phones that we carry around. I mean, that just gets in people's minds all the time. Of course, the, the drugs that are so rampant in our society. But, you know, there, there are uh, solutions to that. And I think the Dream Center here, you guys are having amazing wins, you know, for, for people who come here and they really want to get free. They are being set free. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the testimonies, the graduates of your program, uh, there's nothing like it. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, recently our, go our governor said something that was kind of tragic in a way. You know, he got up and said, it's irresponsible to say that somebody can deal with life's problems without being self-medicated. And I think that's kind of the prevailing spirit around Los Angeles is like, since the pandemic, we've given up. Like, it's almost like I, we can't make it, you know? So let's just try to like live in this survival mindset. Um, let's build really expensive hotels for the homeless and um, give them a place to stay and not really intrude too much into their personal lives. And let's just try to like be as safe as possible and realizing that we really can't conquer a lot of these problems. And the Dream Center is on the opposite end of that. That's like, you know, this is not safe. This is dangerous. This is going to be the hardest year of your life. But it'll be the best year of your life. If you give a year of your life to this program, you are going to flourish. And you're going to. And so I, I really believe that in America, there's just like a overall, ever since COVID, we saw it come and we always knew that the devastation would be worse a couple years after COVID than during COVID even. And um, I'm really seeing a crisis of hope where just, just a layer of life that's gone down to a place where people just don't feel quite as hopeful anymore. And, you know, when Nehemiah rebuilt the walls of the city, you know, there was joy, there was a project, there was an excitement, there was things that were happening, and there's progress being made. But do you feel like one of the great, you know, things that's happening in America is a crisis of hope? No doubt about it. And I think that, you know, without Jesus Christ, without the gospel message, without the word of God, you know, it really, it really is hopeless. When, when, you, when you have... Christ in your heart, and you, you feel his power surging, the Holy Spirit uh, moving you toward a better tomorrow, uh, you do have that hope. I was in uh, Starbucks. I'm down on my break here downtown. I come to Los Angeles. <laughs> That's awesome. For a 30-day 30, 30 sabbatical every yeah, year. So like Dad's apartment you stay in is right next to homeless encampment, so you had literally have to like fight through to get to your room. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so I, there's a Starbucks right across Welcome. the street. And so yesterday I went in there. I was studying in the morning. It's about about six o'clock, and um, a homeless guy walks in, and he says, "Hey man, um, can you buy me a cup of coffee?" I said, "Sure, I'll buy you a cup of coffee." So walk up there, get this man whatever he wants. He goes, "I just want coffee." Bought him the cup of coffee. So he starts. It's like he changed immediately his mindset, and uh, he starts with some gibberish about, you know. Uh, aliens and things like that i said okay well god bless you man enjoy the coffee well he leaves the restaurant five minutes later it comes back in starts yelling and screaming looks at me and starts yelling at me i said hey i just bought you the cup of coffee and he looked at me like he was completely clueless about oh, wow. what had happened and you know so i i do there is a a mental health you know, crisis taking place. But I do believe there, there still is that, that flicker of normalcy still in the people, Yes. you know, because he had a normal conversation with me for a mm -hmm. while, but then this, something shifted. So, uh, man, it, it is a crisis, and that's why, again, uh, you're seeing that with people who come into the Dream Center. You're seeing both sides, you know, of those personalities, but you're also seeing God transform these lives. And uh, after a year of discipleship, you know, that, that normal side of them begins to take root and take over, and they get their sanity back. Yeah, you know, you know rather than building $140 million complexes, if we're, like we're doing in L.A. for like 150 units or 150 people to live in or something like that, you know, it would almost be like better fiscally responsible that if you would just give everyone who graduated one year um, recovery program $10,000 to restart their life. Hmm. They'll say, well, what, what, they might do something bad with it, but they got a better chance to do something good with it with one year of being sober under their belt, you know? And uh, I, I think a lot of times people just aren't thinking outside the box regarding what, what you could do and ideas. And, and, then, and the culture right now is very strange. One of the craziest things that's going on right now in the culture is, is a lot of people are really struggling in ways I've never seen before. For example, 
four times in one year, four times, I've had people at gas stations come up to me and say, hey, man, do you have any money for gas? I'm short of gas. And it's not a hustle. It's people like literally can't fill up their car. That's happened to me four times in one year uh, at the gas station. I said, yeah, I'll fill up your gas tank. Man, thank you. I'm just trying to like get to my job and my work. And I'm like, this has got to be a trend if it's happened four times in one year. And it's never happened in my entire life. So there, there is a great... Um, it's happening in Phoenix, too. Yeah, and people, like, even at the Dream Center, you know, the donations come in. You see a lot of people sometimes, you know, want to make their donation, but it says credit card failed to process. And, and I always pray for those people. I'm like, man, they're trying. I mean, they still want to give, and maybe it's nothing left in their bank account. And I say, Lord, bless them, because their heart's still in the right desire. But are you you seeing the same thing in Arizona, as, as I mentioned, too, just... A, a overall struggle of people just to get from their day-to-day -day activities. Oh, there is, big time. You know, every gas station I go to, there's there's a person walking around. I'm not sure if their motive is, but they're they're asking people for money. And that's new. Yeah. I, I haven't seen that in Arizona, in, in Phoenix, and in, in the Scott, Scottsdale area. So uh, these are very difficult times for people. Um, and yet, at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm seeing the church surge forward you know i'm seeing you know god meet needs and, and new programs are starting and i think that the church really has to kind of, kind of weigh the times we're in and make yes. some shifts and alterations with regard to the way we do ministry to meet the current needs of people yeah you know i think during covid too when you uh, kept your church open during that time one of the very few ones in the country to do it i think you inspired a lot of people to you know take the step forward because i think a lot of people in the very beginning all of us did the first couple months we all had really good well intentions about, okay, you know, this is going on and, you know, we've never experienced anything like this before. We were all kind of going along with it for a while because we wanted to, to be a part of it. And then we realized how many people we were losing along the way. I mean, we were feeding people at that Dream Center uh, food line dr driving by. We had the police say, Op um, go ahead and open your church. And we're like, we're not supposed to. He said, what? We need something good happening here. Wow. You know, but it does take people who break barriers. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like David had knocked down Goliath in order for everyone else to, to storm into the valley and come back to life again. Mm -hmm. And I feel that you guys are one of the churches that kind of knocked down the giant that let everyone else know that, you know, when a barrier is broken, then everyone else can begin to re-engage with people and help people and get their lives back together again. And so I, I've always felt your church, um, one of the greatest churches in America, Dream City Church, um, is a barrier-breaking church. And you just constantly had the courage and boldness um, to break barriers, and uh, you do it with a smile, you do it with joy, you do it with, uh, but with great aggressive boldness, whether it be tackling poverty in your city or human trafficking, all the things that you guys are doing. What's it like when, when you take a bold step forward, you don't have the money or finances or anything to do it, um, do you just see the end line of where it's going to be, or you just kind of step out and say, I don't know if this is going to work, but we're just going to go with it because I feel that it's right in my heart? Well, I I've really tried, you know, 2020, you know, the summer of love, you know, you know the whole thing that happened. I, I really try to operate by just one slogan, and it's never wrong to do what's right. Mm -hmm. And I just really try to do what I felt in my heart was the right thing to do. With regard to keeping open the church, uh, we didn't have the restrictions in Arizona that you had here. And so there really were no restrictions in Arizona. They, were, they asked us to stay closed for the first, I think, month, and I think we stayed closed for three weeks, and then they came out and said, you know, we're going to ask you to stay closed for another two months. I said, no, nah, we're, we're not, we're not <laughs> no going to do that. And, you know, for those who pastor churches know that was the most difficult time to pastor a church because I could do no right. You know, if I opened up, you know, I'm killing people. Mm -hmm. If I closed it down, I had no faith. Yeah. You know, and so uh, either way, you're going to you're going to lose. So I just had to figure really what would Jesus do and I, if Jesus we're the pastor of the church, and he is the pastor of our church. But would he, honestly, would he say, please don't come to church because you might get sick and die. I don't know what I would do. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, think about that. Here's what hit me. Back in 2020, I, I thought, everyone wants to be relevant. Mm -hmm. The church really wants to be relevant. Okay, if we're not talking about what our kids are seeing on their phones, if we're afraid to go there, then we're not being relevant. Right. Because they're, they're talking about all the issues, the, the trans issues. They're talking about, you know, the, the same sex issues. And, and they're all getting feeds from their phone hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times every single week. 
Okay, so if, if that's polluting their minds and they come to church and there's no defense ever given mm. about, what, about how Jesus feels about these issues, mm -hmm. what the Bible says about these issues, then personally, I kind of felt like we, met, we missed the mark. And so I just said that, you know, we're not going to dwell on these issues every week. We're going to you know, preach the word of God. But when they come up in culture, we're going to take a moment to address it in church, what the Bible says about it, and move forward. So, you know, I, I just felt like... Um, it, it's, it's just that season yeah. that uh, we can walk and we can chew gum at the same time. We have confounded, we have confused our city because here <laughs> we are having a big dream center, second yeah, largest yeah, dream center, yeah. you know, second to yours here. Yeah. Uh, we fed, fed, fed over a million hot meals, you know, last year. Uh, we're housing 300 people at our dream center free Amazing. of charge. We're the uh, world's largest human sex trafficking relief organization. No one's even close with regard to that as far as rooms and facilities. True. I mean, it's just what God is. So we're known in our city for that, almost like a Democrat-run uh -huh. you know, organization. Absolutely. But on the other side, we stand in the pulpit, and we boldly you know, proclaim the word of God when it comes to issues of life, issues of supporting Israel, uh, you know, all, the, all these issues that... The culture has told us you're being political. Well, no, you have stepped. Those are all biblical issues. And you've stepped in the, into the church's world, and you grabbed those issues, and now you made them political, and you say we can't talk about them. Yeah. Well, I, I disagree with that. And so that, that's just where we are. Uh, we've confused our city. We're, we're, we're bold <laughs> from the pulpit on the issues, but we love people. And we don't just talk about loving people. Right. We put our money where our mouth is. We pour millions of dollars, as you're doing every oh, year, it's unbelievable. into helping people. So it's one thing to say, oh, you just need to love people. But, uh, you know, it says something else when you really put resources behind loving people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, during political seasons, people come here all the time. They're like, hey, I want, I want to get on stage and say something. Or they come to church and, you know, I'm from this district, whatever. And um, I, I've just informed our church. I said, anybody who wants to get up and, and not go on a political ramp and say, hi, my name is John, I'm running for Republicans or Democrats in this district. And usually they get up and say, well, I love what the Dream Center is doing, all that. Very general. But I, I, let them, I let them all come up and say something. Here's why. I told our church, I said the issue is evangelism. If, if they come into the house of God and they have to sit through an entire service and hear the word of God and be in a culture that is so welcoming, yet might be different in a lot of what you believe in, I want them to walk out there and say, that was the greatest experience I've ever had in my entire life. Mm -hmm. Everything is about evangelism. It's about, it's about getting as many people as you can into the presence of God, where they can experience something maybe they've never experienced before. And so um, I think, you know, all of us were just in that place of just trying to win people to Christ. And, and the church has always been a, a town square for public conversation about things and life and opinions and uh, and, and just, you know, but that, that muzzle has been tried to put upon us. But, you know, I think as a leader, the most important thing that you can do is do what God's called you to do with all your heart and um, have a big smile and just keep moving forward. Like during COVID, you know, when we started feeding people and putting food in the back and they were uh, uh, the trunks of people, um, I asked myself, you know, are we essential? Because they said essential workers. It was, and I said, yeah, we're essential. You know, we've given billions of dollars of economic aid to this community. And so we just went out there and served and smile. It's amazing what you could accomplish when you just smile and act dumb. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? And, yeah. just, and just do it. And um, we saw the unbelievable experience of guys in rehab making meals and serving them in the country. But, you know, I think there's an unbelievable sense of a need for boldness in our culture and uh, backed up by kindness and practical, you know, loving in, in, in ways. And so I, I just thank you so much for all that you're doing. And I, I, I do see a whole new church emerging from this. And I think a lot of people are getting from a place of just kind of like maintaining and leveling off to starting to surge again. Um, there's going to be a lot of conflict in the next few months as we head to this election season. So I really think that, um, you know, being there for people is going to be very, very important because there's going to be a lot of people who will be going through a lot of uh, traumatized moments. Cultures are going to be in your face, bickering, fighting, slander, all of this. And, um, but if we could just keep our eyes on the mission of Christ and, keep our eyes on um, on a hope that is so far greater in this world, you know, and yeah. I think we're going to make it. Yeah, and I love what you said. Dad's always said it like this, and I stole it from Dad, but, you know, if people don't like us for our position, 
there's nothing we can do about that. Right. They shouldn't dislike us for our disposition. Wow. So we should have a position of honoring the Lord, uh, speaking to the culture when the Bible speaks to the culture, but also doing it with a with a spirit of a smile on our face, a spirit of love, not mean spirited, uh, a spirit of not trying to push people away, but trying to bring them into the conversation. Now, if they don't like us for a position, we can't change that. That's the word of God. But they shouldn't dislike us for how we do it, our disposition. And that goes to evangelism and, and reaching the lost and always keeping those lines of communication open. Well, you heard it from one of the great leaders in America today, Luke Barnett, Dream City Church. Thank you so much for being a part of this conversation on the We Get To podcast. Thank you so much.